everybody. I'm Jean. Great to see you all here. Um, I'm very pleased to have this esteemed guest with me, too, and for what I know will be a very interesting program. So I just have to tell you that um, Milton Access Cable is filming this program, and I want to thank the friends of the Milton Public Library for their support of our events. Now let me tell you about Ray Brown. Uh, he is a broadcast veteran with more than 30 years experience in commercial, public radio, and television. After an extensive career for WNRI and WJAR in Rhode Island, he worked at WCODFM until the early 90s and has now been broadcasting on Boston's classical station, WCRB, he corrected me, 99.5 FM for 15 years. In February 2015, he began appearing as a regular guest on National Public Radio's weekend edition, Saturday with Scott Simon, the topic, birds. Please join me in a warm welcome for Ray. Thank you so much, Gene. Hello, everybody. I'm going to go off mic just for a moment here. I, I want to do a little show and tell just because it wasn't really planned, but a, a, some oh. friends gave me this shirt yesterday, and I just figured I'd You don't see that often, a blue bird on a glass of beer. I mean, I and I didn't know why until I turned it around and I saw this from the Portsmouth Brewery. So, that at least partially explains it. Yeah. And I have something else about bluebirds in, in, a, in a minute, but another thing. Not another shirt. Though. Another shirt. So. I think we figured out how to make this all work. So, so we'll see. I don't know if I push one of these buttons. I'll just like it to happen. Oh, this is uh, one of the first uh, ideas for a title for our little slide presentation here, but uh, we didn't pick that one. Right. Probably that was a good idea. <laughs> then there was this one. It was just reflecting the idea that a lot of birds fly really high, yeah. and uh, so you don't want to be afraid of heights, right. which is why one reason I'm not a bird, because I'm afraid of heights. That's not the only reason. But. So um, we came up with something a little more, I don't know, just more of um, Explanatory, descriptive, as the mi magic of migration and the hazards of the journey. Of course, migration isn't magic, it just seems that way. I mean, just because of the amazing feats that uh, birds can accomplish. And the, the hazards we'll talk about a little bit later on in the, in the presentation. Um, you know, birds face so many challenges in migration with storms and all the other obstacles that they face, and predators and so on, and uh, even when they're not migrating. So many, many challenges, and we'll talk uh, a little bit about that as we uh, go along here. So not only uh, birds migrate, whales, monarch butterflies, elephants, tourists. <laughs> I did this little presentation for a group, an Audubon group down in Florida the other day, so. I figure those are Massachusetts folks there going down there. <laughs> uh, so, I guess the biggest question that people ask, or the first question, is why? Why do they migrate? And that's a whole another story in itself. A whole, could be a whole another presentation in itself. Let's say they need the exercise. Okay, sounds reasonable. Tired of the same old tropical fruits? <laughs> sure, those papayas can get old after a while. Let's see, what else could they reason be? Red Sox, in fact, <laughs> there you go. Um, they didn't have a big crowd there yesterday. I don't know if I got to America because it was raining. So, um, but there is a little connection here with Fenway Park because it's the, it's the place that where I first saw this bird. Anybody recognize that bird? See if we can get it to vocalize here. No, it's actually called the common nighthawk. Okay, it's not a hawk at all. Uh, it's actually a whippoorwill relative. So this bird, you'll see usually at dusk is when it's most active, but even after dusk, it kind of occupies a night slot that swallows would have during the day. 
flying around catching insects in the air. It has that little tiny bill, but a gigantic mouth that it opens up to catch uh, insects. So the Fenway Park connection is that I was at a night game at Fenway Park. when I, That was the first time I saw one of these up in the lights around the park. And I remember well because the Red Sox were getting killed that night. Wow, so it was a really good distraction to see that bird. But it's a really cool bird to see. Where I live in the south end of Boston, you know, the houses, uh, the buildings used to be gravel roof and asphalt on the, on the tops of the flat roofs. And those have been almost completely replaced now by, by rubber roofs, these big slabs of rubber, which are you know, very really superior in terms of keeping the water <laughs> coming into your building, for example. Uh, but not good for nighthawks because they nest on gravel areas. So they, the gravel roofs would kind of replicate their natural habitat of gravel areas along riverbanks and so on. But uh, So we don't see many common nighthawks. We used to see these all the time in the summer. You could be walking down Tremont Street and you'd hear, uh, you'd hear that. You would play again. If no one gets to play at once. No. Okay, so uh, what triggers this migration? Various things. I think I skipped the slide here, did I? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I gave away the whole thing here, sorry. <laughs> no spoiler alerts in this. So there's rising temperatures, favorable wind patterns, and length of daylight, and they all do play some part, but uh, as you've just seen, length of daylight is really the biggest trigger, um, at least for long distance migrants, not so much for shorter distance migrants, which really are affected more by the temperature and local conditions. The birds, of course, in the tropics have no idea of what the weather is here when they're down in Panama or Costa Rica or Northern South America. So this length of daylight thing actually causes hormonal changes in the birds, and it creates a real urge for them to migrate. So there's a big word that uh, explains or describes this. Zugenrua. You can use that later if you want. But, uh, it's, uh, so it really translates to migratory restlessness, which is what happens with birds. And that was really demonstrated in a beautiful way back in the, I think it was the mid-60s, by the Emlin brothers, two scientists from Cornell. And they were trying to prove that birds had this restlessness and that they also knew which way they were going to travel. So they created something they named for themselves, and it's called the Emlin Funnel. So what you see is this funnel with at the bottom where you see that blue part, that's an ink pad. And this would be inside the planetarium, so they could see an array of stars. And of course, it could manipulate uh, the star patterns. They couldn't fly out on the screen there, but they could see. And what would happen is when they made that star pattern vis visible to the birds, they would orient themselves by those stars in the direction that they needed or wanted to travel in migration. And they would demonstrate it by, by way of the fact that the bird trying to fly would get that ink on its feet. And they would open the funnel later and they could see where the bird had tried to climb up the side uh, of that funnel. And, and it would match up with the direction indicated by the stars. And of course, birds use star patterns to migrate, but a lot of other things. Um, including the position of the moon and uh, a lot of physical features on the, on the uh, surface, mountains and rivers, coastlines, and also the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, and there's been a lot of research fairly recently about that, learning more, scientists are learning more and more about how birds, some scientists say it's an interesting way to describe it, but in a sense that they can see the magnetic fields of the Earth. Not in a visual way exactly, but 
through their eyes somehow with some kind of chemical process going on there. It was discovered quite a long time ago that pigeons had little metallic fragments in their gill that seemed to have something to do with them being able to orient by, by way of the, uh, the magnetic field. But now there's, there's a lot more beyond that, beyond those little micro uh, fragments in, in a bill of a pigeon that has some connection with the eyes, but there's a lot of research going on about it right now. So all the energy to fly, it's just amazing. You know, some birds fly literally thousands of miles uh, nonstop in, in, in migration. So there's a big word, big word that explains that. That's not the word. <laughs> this is not a big, a big fat word. There it is, yes, fat. Because birds actually do that. It sounds counterintuitive, but they fatten up before they migrate. In many cases, birds will actually double their weight uh, before migration using the fat that they acquire um, to fuel them on, on, their, on their journey. So berries, wheat, are, are different kinds of grains are, are some of the things that birds need to convert to fat in order to make these astounding journeys that they, that they do make. Here's a beautiful shorebird that Wilson's fowl wrote just for uh, demonstration purposes. This is before uh, the bird has acquired all that extra weight. And here it is after it's fattened up. Oh, <laughs> I really meant it was going to have like a really fat and fat fowl rope, but I couldn't find the picture. So we worked together with this elephant seal uh, to just kind of demonstrate or make the point there, by exaggeration. Um, yeah. So if you ever see one like this, would you give me a call? <laughs> ah, yes, there's the question about adding fat. He added this fat, but. How does adding fat help them? Do you think it would be kind of the opposite? It would weigh themselves down? And the reason is that they can metabolize that fat in such an amazing way. They can use it as though you were putting gasoline into a car. Here's a, an example of one bird. This is a little tiny warbler, a black hole warbler. And you can see that whole central vertical area there, subcutaneous fat that this bird has obtained or developed uh, to feed it in its migration journey. And this particular bird makes it truly amazing to show that in, in the second here. So many birds will not only get that subcutaneous fat like that along the, along the belly area, but even internally, they'll develop pockets of fat around internal organs just to maximize the amount of fat that they can have in their bodies, even as those organs in many cases are shrinking. So they have that trade off there to make the bird lighter by shrinking the organs while, while it's adding some fat. So here's an example of that black pole word with traveling 2200 plus miles, starting off somewhere around here and heading down to Venezuela. And as you can see with that route, that's a pretty much pretty much a non-stop route. They're flying over the open ocean. And unless there's a passing boat they can hop on, or sometimes they do, they have to fly direct for a couple of thousand miles over the open ocean. They can't land in the water. They would in all likelihood drown if they landed in the water. So they make that direct flight across the ocean. So this is a bird that you normally think of birds here in the other season going, going south in the winter and going from here, let's say, or from Canada down to Central America, Northern South America, near the equator where it's warm. But the Arctic Tern doesn't, doesn't do that. It, doesn't, it has no use for the equatorial regions, apparently. So it'll travel from breeding grounds up in Greenland and travel all the way down to islands off Antarctica. So it will spend the winter down there, at certain low fingers they say, on ice flows and islands off Antarctica. So 
this bird, because of the way it travels way up there in the summer and way down there in the winter, is said to see more sunlight than any other creature um, on the planet, always in season. So there's the winter. This is a bird, this is another migration champion. I mean, it's really a champion. This is a bar-tailed godwit. And this bird will, will travel something like this. So from Alaska down to Australia and New Zealand. And there was a bird just, um, I think it was a year ago, that broke a previous record. For this flight again, this is this is non-stop flight over the ocean, and also these are not albatrosses. These are not birds that are flying along. They're flapping the whole time. They really don't fly. They just flap for this incredible distance of so something like this record breaker of eight thousand miles, and it's in about eleven days. It's just a truly incredible feat. This is the sooty shearwater. And this is a bird that stays at sea virtually all its entire life, except when it comes to shore for mating. And we'll show a couple of different, a couple of individual birds and, and the, the track that they make, just cruising all through the year over, over the areas of the Pacific Ocean looking for food. So just two birds, one in green and one in red, is showing these two paths that, that were uh, satellite tracked to uh, give you an idea of the amazing distances these uh, sooty shearwaters make. That's, that's the mileage for a sooty shearwater, about 40,000 miles in, uh, in one year. So those are some of the incredible migratory things that uh, birds do. I was gonna mention about the, the, the use of fat, and um, I'm gonna contradict myself in a couple minutes, I'll explain why. Uh, but about the use of fat, somebody calculated, and I don't know how accurate this is, that if you could somehow make a comparison between the bird burning that fat and the car burning gasoline, the bird would get 140,000 miles per gallon, which is pretty good. So I mentioned at the beginning about survival challenges and certainly so many in migration. Uh, when birds hit storms and so on, as they, as they so often do. Most well, songbirds fly at night, by the way. It's cooler at night, the winds are less at night, and they have many fewer predators uh, to, to uh, deal with. But still plenty of other challenges involved. And even in non-migration, you have all these other things uh, causing them trouble from cats, particularly feral cats, but also house, household cats that, uh, that roam free, and are, you know, just by instinct are uh, chasing after and killing birds. And more even than towers, lots of birds crash into towers, but not as many as, as fall victim to cats. And there's cars and windows, and window crashes are a huge uh, factor in killing birds. And between these two, according to the latest statistics that I've seen, it's really cats that kill most birds. It's pretty hard, I think, to, to get any kind of a real number on this, but the estimates are somewhere between one and three billion birds are killed by cats every year, just in the U.S. So you can imagine if you multiply that around the world, there's many, many billions of birds uh, are killed by, by outdoor cats. And I, often, I often wonder how we have any birds uh, left. And seriously, because there are so many things that, that, uh, that, are, that are killing birds. Historically, it's always been said the biggest threat to birds is habitat destruction. And especially when we talk about migrating birds and these birds we're showing from the neotropics coming, coming up here in the, in the springtime. Um, so they, they depend on habitat here, and then they depend on habitat down in the tropics. So if one is not working for them, they're in trouble. If both is not working for them, they're in big trouble. 
So you see some of the clear clear cutting of the forest uh, on the left hand side, you know, sort of denuding the landscape, taking away habitat and food sources for birds, and also cause uh, tremendous erosion. And then on the right hand side, we have uh, um, a temperate forest in the northwest US, where a lot of the forest there has been clear cut. And of course, that's removing habitat for birds. And at the same time, it's making it easier for a lot of predators to get access to where birds are nesting. So that's another double whammy for birds that make habitat destruction. So difficult for them. One of those predators, by the way, is another bird. And not one you might really expect. It's not a raptor or anything like that. Anybody recognize that bird on the right of the big one there? It's a brown headed, that's a, ch a fledgling. Shrike? It's not a shrike, it's a brown headed cowbird. And that's a, that's a fledgling just out of the nest where it's been fed by that tiny little yellow warbler there. Um, so brown headed cowbirds are a big, big problem for a lot of songbirds. And the reason is because they lay their eggs in other birds' nests. You know, like cuckoos in Europe like that, they call them an obligate brood parasite because they not only lay their eggs in other birds' nests, but that's the only place they lay their eggs. They never make their own nests. Um, and historically, they used to follow the bison herds in the American West. And the speculation is, seems logical that they couldn't really stay put at any one place to nest. So they developed uh, a pattern where they would start to lay their eggs in other birds' nests, and they evolved this technique or this uh, habit uh, ever since. And as you can see with this bird next to that little yellow warbler, which is an adult, uh, you can imagine what happens in the nest when these birds hatch. Uh, obviously, it will outcompete the, uh, the little songbirds, sparrows, and, and warblers and such uh, in, the, in the nest. And sadly, most birds don't seem to realize or can't notice you know, somehow that this egg, which is much bigger than their own eggs, isn't their egg. And they'll brood the, the egg and the chicks and raise them. And of course, a lot of them don't survive because the, uh, the cowbird will, will outcompete them. There, there is one bird, and I'm trying to think, I think it's the white-throated sparrow that has come up with a defense where if this happens in their nest, they'll build another nest on top of it. And then if the cowbird comes back and there's more eggs, they'll build another nest on top of that. And this is an example of one where there are five nests high because they kept going back and forth. So the brown headed cowbird, I mean, it's a protected bird because it's a native bird. So it's protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. I know some people though that, um, what should I say, don't, don't pay attention to that particular rule when it comes to brown headed cowbirds. Um, that's just between us. Um, so I read not long ago the two biggest traded commodities in the world are oil, number one, and coffee. Number two. Um, so there's a thing about coffee when it comes to birds as well. And it has to do with, well, it relates to that picture we saw about the, that tropical jungle area, the tropical forest area that was denuded. A lot of the big coffee companies, or most of them, do what's known as sun grown coffee. So what it means is they grow the coffee the way you grow corn soybeans. They strip the land, plant the, plant the coffee, and grow it in the sun, which allows them to get tremendous yields. But in the process, they're using a lot of herbicides, and pesticides, fertilizer, and they're causing uh, a lot of erosion in, in the process to grow coffee on this grand scale, you know, as a, as a great way to uh, increase profits. So, one solution to that, partial solution anyway, is 
something called shade grown coffee. Uh, sad to say, most people don't still know about shade grown coffee. It seems it's not that easy to get. Um, the folks who make it have a real tough time getting supermarkets to stock it, for example. Um, we find it in some co ops, mostly um, it's online. You can, some of the uh, Audubon shops, like uh, Mass Audubon out in Lincoln, uh, carry this coffee. And, um, the Boston Nature Center in Boston, the Bird Watcher store uh, down in Cape Cod carry this coffee. But mostly it's uh, online. Um, again, sadly, there are some coffee makers who will claim to make shade grown coffee. So they might have like one tree. And they'll say, so that's shade grown coffee we got here. Look at that shadow. Um, but the real shade grown coffee is grown under the natural forest canopy. And it's so good for birds that birding tours will actually go to shade grown coffee farms to look at birds. That's how friendly it is, um, it is for, for birds and bird survival. But that's the, the sticker to really look for from the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. Because they have the most stringent oversight of these um, coffee farms. So if you see that symbol on the coffee, you know that it's really genuine shade grown coffee that, that really provides uh, habitat for birds. So here's, these are just some of the birds we're, we're looking for and seeing here this spring. Some of them arriving pretty soon. Let's see if I, our double click method is going to produce a sun. The Blackburnian warbler. What a beautiful creature that is. There's a woman named Phoebe Schnetzinger who uh, wasn't interested in birds especially. And she saw one of these in her backyard and she got hooked. She ended up breaking the world record some years later for number of species seen. Um, there's a wonderful book called Life List that talks all about uh, her. She, um, well, the downside to it is she kind of abandoned her family in the process. Um, but she sure did see a, a lot of a lot of birds. Uh, <laughs> that's again, that's another presentation. Too. So let's see. Anybody recognize this this guy? I see this bird a lot. It's a pretty pretty sh you know showy bird in a way with that bright yellow, and that black mask. Uh, but sometimes really hard to see, even when you can hear it sort of almost right in front of you. It's the common yellow throat. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can hear this guy. Mm -hmm. Witchity, witchity, witchity is kind of mnemonic that you can apply uh, to the common yellow throat. I, I live right in the city in Boston, and I saw that he's right in front of my house one day, so it became an instant favorite. Anyone recognize this guy? That's an American red start, another, another uh, neotropical warbler. We actually have a lot of these uh, around this area. They, they do nest in uh, Massachusetts. How did they get that name? <laughs> I know it's not really red. Well, there's a number of different red start species, and some of them are not, some of them are more red than others. But you know, it's like a lot of bird names. You have to have a little imagination to make it make sense. There is a little bit of red there. But you know, oh, you see it? Yeah. So, um, you, know, you know, this is a red bellied woodpecker. Right? It doesn't really have a red belly, it's got kind of a pink wash. But that bird, I think they call a red bellied woodpecker because there's a red headed woodpecker whose entire head is red. So, to avoid. Uh, confusion. There's, a, there's quite a few birds like that that are sort of misnamed. There's like, <laughs> well, you know, not another language, but I'm thinking about the, the American robin, which is um, called that because it resembles a European bird, the European robin, and they're not related. But when the colonists came here, they saw this bird and reminded them uh, reminded them of that, so they call it the American bottom. So it's actually a, a thrush. So uh, some people say it should be renamed 
we call the black-headed thrush, which would be the more descriptive name. This is, this is a, an aside, you know, there's a kind of a big controversy now about birds that are named after people. You know, from Audubon, so there's been a controversy recently about whether Audubon society should change its name because John James Audubon was a slave holder and uh, not a nice guy for many ways. But there are many other um, uh, birds named after people who are a little bit unsavory in many cases. So there's kind of a movement going on now to change all the names of birds with people's names and give them descriptive names like black-headed thrush or whatever it might be. Um, it's a tough, you know, it's great for people who make field guides, but none of them at all do field guides. But uh, <laughs> that happens all the time anyway. There's so many field guides coming out all the time. It's just you know, it's kind of crazy, but it's, it's great. You can see these a lot of times in the uh, Boston Public Garden. There's a pretty good spot. There. Then this little guy, kind of an early, early arrival that I, I call this the warbler, warbler that thinks it's a nuthatch. There's a way it kind of climbs down branches and stuff. Uh, they call it the sound of a squeaky wheel, sometimes. Some white people describe the sound of the uh, White, the, the, the black and white. Word. And then there's this amazingly beautiful singer, the wood thrush. A lot of people think that's the most beautiful singer that we have. So, just an idea about some wonderful organizations that help protect these birds and some of them. There are so many of them, but these are kind of some of my favorite ones. Uh, the American Bird Conservancy, ABC. They do a lot of terrific work, uh, not only in the U.S., but, but all, over the, all over the world. In fact, they were instrumental just very recently in helping to save a, a parakeet species in Brazil. It's the only place in the world where this bird is located. It was almost extinct, but they just reestablish the bird with thinking they might be able to help it regain its lost territory in northeast of Brazil. They do a lot of great work with that. They also have a program dealing with wind turbines, which are really controversial. It's kind of environmentalist versus environmentalist when it comes to wind turbines, because of the obvious advantages with the clean power source, but they kill a lot of birds, um, including a lot of raptors. Eagles, uh, golden eagles, bald eagles. Um, a lot of it has to do with where they're placed. And what the American Bird Conservancy does is try to encourage people who are doing this to put them in such, put them, locate them in such a way that it's not right in the middle of the, the migratory routes of birds. Unfortunately, a lot of times the best wind is where the birds are, are too. So it's kind of tricky, but they've done lots of lawsuits too, and won some of them. Uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, really respected and known all over the world, a wonderful educational organization, creator of things like eBird, which is a fabulous new um, electronic way of connecting people all over the world. There are tens of thousands of people there who report their sightings on, on eBird and help other, other birders find them, and it's a wonderful source for conservation science, among many other things that do. They have all kinds of courses for birding, from you know sheer beginners to uh, people who are really, uh, really schooled in birding. They have all kinds of great programs. Nature Conservancy, um, famous for really buying up properties all over the world, millions and millions of acres, and they typically turn them over to conservation organizations to protect them. So that's been a favorite line for a long time. And then there's our own Mass Audubon, which is uh, really the oldest Audubon organization in the country. One of the biggest, too. Um, I'm trying to remember what 
their membership is, it's, um, I'm not even going to say it because I'll probably get the number wrong, but it's many, 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 many thousands of people uh, doing a lot of great work and they have wonderful sanctuaries all over this, all over this state. And then there's the Talking Birds radio show, which I recommend. Uh, Sunday mornings, 9.30 to 10 is when we do our show live. And then we also uh, release it as a podcast and we live stream it as well. So thanks to that live stream, um, we get folks calling in from all over the country, which is really exciting. And uh, hear from people you know, by email and stuff who listen to the podcast versions. So um, they tell me we've been doing this for 17 years now. Which I don't really believe. I think it's been seven. No, it really has been seventeen. But uh, so we we uh, we we have a really great time still doing the show. You know, people always say, "I think you still find stuff to talk about about birds after all that time." But that's an example of how fascinating birds are and how how much there is to talk about with birds. And we we do a lot with conservation talk as well. Here are just some of the. Some of the little segments that we have. A rose breast of rose feet there. But, so we do a little piece for every week called a featured feathered friend, kind of a corny name. And we just do a little recorded, produced piece about it. Some music sometimes, and just highlighting a particular species and finding out interesting things about them. Then we have our man and Mike. Anybody know Mike O'Connor? One of the famous bird watchers, general store in Cape Cod. I guess it's not that famous. <laughs> but he's <laughs> uh, at Orleans. It's right near the Orleans Rotary. Yeah. So Mike is a, is a content contributor and also a sponsor of our show since we started. Um, he likes really big binoculars. And um, Mike is also a, a, a wonderful writer. He's written a couple of books. One is called why don't woodpeckers get headaches? Kind of explains how woodpeckers can hammer on hard wood the way they do and survive it. Uh, and the other one I mentioned, for those who came in late, you didn't see my shirt here, my bluebird shirt. On a glass of beer. Yes, yeah. it's from the Portsmouth Brewery. That's why it's on a glass of beer, I guess. Thank you. Um, Mike's other book is called Why Do Bluebirds Hate Me? Because he's been trying to get bluebirds to come in his yard for 30 some years. But last week, he finally got them. So he is so excited. It only stayed there, he said, for about 15 seconds. But he's still thrilled about it. Probably went out and bought another pair of binoculars. He's, uh, Mike is a, a great part of our show. So he, he typically does just little pieces on feeding birds, tips on feeding birds in, in your backyard, how to track them, all that kind of stuff. So if you ever get down to Orleans, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. It, it has all kinds of stuff other than just uh, you know bird feeders and bird houses and binoculars and scopes and books and videos and bird clothing. It's all very much in this world. Yeah, the mystery bird con est. I saw this, uh, I don't know how this came out printed that way, but I sort of liked it. And uh, so we haven't fixed it yet. But uh, this is a little call-in contest that we do. So we play the sound of a bird, we give some clues about it, and uh, folks call in and we give away bird feeders and shade grown coffee, and sometimes binoculars, Vortex Optics is a great supporter of the show, so we've given away some binoculars and scopes from Vortex Optics. And we give away books from a company called Udio Books. It's an online bookstore that uh, their claim to fame is that they have one of the biggest selections of birding books in the world. We do, I mentioned about conservation, so we, almost every show we do a salute either to an individual or a group is doing something good for the planet, uh, about birds or not about birds, just conservation in general. So we'll do that on the slippery. Then we have a little thing called the Science Corner. So you might recognize what's, what that is here. It's a 
what they call a murmuration of starlings. And starlings get into these flocks of thousands and thousands of birds and swirl around in the sky. It's an amazing thing to see. There, there are many videos up online, easy to find, where you can watch these incredible swirling flocks of, of starlings. And it's thought that they do it mostly just to avoid predators because it's very hard for a predator to focus in on these birds when they're swirling in it like this. But it's still a phenomenon that's sort of unlike anything else. This is a new, a new thing where we're doing what we, what we call plurting, which is kind of a strange word. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a mashup word. We actually, we actually borrowed it from folks in Sweden who started something called plogging, which was picking up litter while jogging. So we thought we'll apply this to birds, and we call it flirting. So yeah, so we have uh, folks all over now that have joined us with this, and they, whenever they go out birding, they take a plastic bag with them and maybe one of those things to pick up, uh, long, long handle things to pick up trash, uh, and. and uh, clean up birding trails and beaches and so forth uh, as they go. So we've, we've created the flirting pledge and we, we have little iron-on badges. Anyone who wants to become a proud flirter, send you one of these iron-on badges that declares your uh, interest in cleaning up the environment. We, we have a, a wonderful friend of the show out in Michigan who made this logo for us. Every one of those letters represents a different bird. That's what you saw. You have a penguin, you have loon, you have a, you have me and Mike O'Connor there in the eye, and Fred McGregor is part of our group. The awesome Aussie we call it. She's from no. There's a there's our proud bird patch. Put that litter in there. Looks like a can of Bud Light, though. It actually it is actually the sensibility. What's the water so, uh, What's he drinking? I mean, the rye, the rye on your shirt. What is he drinking? The blueberry. Oh, well, the blueberry. What kind of beer? Yeah. Oh, anybody know what kind of beer that is? It's an IPA of some sort. Of thing. I don't know. I'll, I'll find out for you though. Yeah. I think you could add it, add it to the bird feeders in the store. <laughs> yeah, he's probably going to have these in there. Yeah, I'll have to call the Portsmouth Brewery if I can get to the bottom of that. So this is the last slide of our show. This is the closing slide. However, um, I mentioned about contradicting myself. So just briefly, this one other thing. This I just found out about this today. Um, so I'll just read this because I just got this off a, off a news story. Uh, that a team of scientists led by researchers at UMass Stammers made a, a surprising discovery. They said migratory songbirds fuel themselves by burning not only fat, but a lot of protein making up lean body mass, including muscle, to power their... This is a whole new thing. I mean, this has been thought of for decades that it was just fat that they burned in order to migrate. But apparently they do this protein thing early in, in their migration. So the new research says songbirds can burn 20% of their muscle mass in migration and then build it all back in a matter of days. Really extraordinary. <laughs> I know, it, but we can't do it. It's like when the, with the fat name thing, but, you know, but anyway, that's it. Um, so uh, Corey Elo is the postdoctoral researcher at UMass. He's the lead author of the study. And uh, I'm happy to say that he accepted an invitation today to be on our show on May 7th. So if you have a mind too, you could tune in and uh, I'm sure you'll he'll have a lot more to, uh, to say about. I think that's it. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
mentioned the songbird, migration of songbirds. Yeah. Are there other birds besides songbirds? I mean, don't they all make uh, queen some sounds? Well, most birds would make some sort of um, sound, yeah. Not beautiful sounds like songbirds in many cases. Um, you know, a lot of wading birds make a lot of very guttural sounds. Um, so, yeah, so is a seagull a seagull a songbird? No. no. Um, I always like to say there's no such thing as a seagull. There are gulls, many, many kind, <laughs> kinds of gulls, but there's no seagull. But um, there, there are many, many others. You know, here we have herring gulls and ring billed gulls and Bonaparte's gulls and laughing gulls and so on. So many, many kinds. Um, no, they're, so they're not songbirds. And then there, there are many other categories of, of uh, birds, seabirds of the open ocean, or let's say, um, wading birds, um, and, and so many others. And there are raptors like owls and hawks and eagles and falcons. And so there are many, many uh, categories of birds. And then there's that, that, that common nighthawk, which is relative of the uh, whippoorwill. And that's a bird that's uh, also been known as the goat sucker. Uh, <laughs> And the, not that, not the, not the nighthawk, but relatives of the nighthawk, because farmers used to see these birds around their barns at night, and they thought they were going in there and sucking milk from the goats uh -huh. in the barn because they have that big giant mouth. That's why they, not what they thought that. Was a, I checked into it; it's not true. <laughs> they have really, uh, they really do catch uh, insects. So yeah, almost all birds migrate. Even even the mute swan, they, which doesn't vocalize. It, I didn't even say migrate. I didn't say vocalize. Doesn't uh, vocalize very much, but they they can. There are some birds that don't vocalize at all in the sense of having a voice box, uh, like vultures, for example. They just make these horrible sounds, but not even through a through a voice box. The, the sounds that birds make, by the way, are, are doubly incredible in, in a literal sense almost because instead of a, of a larynx like we have, they have something called a syrinx. So it's really like a double voice box. So they can actually harmonize with themselves. Um, one good example is a northern cardinal, really common and loved bird around these parts. And then you hear that that's typical sound, it's kind of like then, that first part that does that curve upward is actually done in two parts. And it's done so seamlessly that you can't tell. So they make that first from one side of the syrinx and then the, to the other side of the syrinx. And they do it so smoothly, it sounds just like it's produced from one source, but it's actually produced in two parts. And that's why, too, you can hear, hear, hear birds like the wood thrush that we heard. And it's a remarkably complex sound. And it's because of that series, that very complex uh, voice box. Yeah. You know, so that, yes, yes, sir. Uh, I can understand <clears throat> migrating and using up the fat, but do they not drink water during that whole flight? In many cases, they don't because they can't. I'm not sure they would like to. Uh, but yeah, but when yeah, when these birds, like the bar-tailed uh, godwood, I was mentioning, the one flies from Alaska to Australia or New Zealand, they they never land. There's no place to land. They can't land on the water. They can't survive in the water. So they're just flying nonstop, flapping for 11 days. And that little black hole warbler, it's the same thing, just flying over the open ocean. It, it, uh, it can't, it can't stop. And on the nesting of the uh, host bird with the uh, uh, cowbird, yeah. you put your eggs in there, you mentioned there was one nest on top of the other. Yeah. Does the host bird leave its own eggs in the lower nest and catch more? Um, 
You know, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. About, I'm not sure about that. It might be that um, they they try to move the eggs sometimes, or they might even roll them out just to get them away from the other other bird. But I, I that's a really good question. Sorry, I don't know if there's another answer. Yeah. One of the most popular bird boxes to have in your backyard is it a bluebird or is it this bird or that bird? Or this bird? I think it's what depending on what bird they like to. Yeah, because they are very specifically designed for, in terms of the size of the hole, for example, in the, in, in the box. Um, you know, they make these very small holes so that um, house sparrows cannot uh, get into them, but they're, they're hard to stop. In fact, they can still, starlings can't get into some of those, but, um, you know, there are these bluebird trails in many places that, that are responsible really for saving bluebirds or from the brink of extinction. So there was a human intervention that, you know, made up for some of our other human interventions that caused the problems in the first place. But those are constantly having to be cleared out of, uh, of house sparrows. They can still squeeze their way. So, yes, ma'am. Are there any unusual ways of wildlife that you find in the wild? Uh, unusual reasons? Yeah. Um, well, there's this Carnegie Hall thing that, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I can think of any unusual uh, reasons that, that, that they sing, and mostly it's for um, claiming territory and uh, warding off competitors uh, for male birds that sing, but it's also communication between birds. And it's actually been relatively recently discovered that Many more female birds than was thought before also sing. Cardinals are, 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 are an example of that, where the female sings. Sometimes they sing different songs from the male, and sometimes the same song, but they'll sing back and forth. Great horned owls, which we have around here quite, quite a lot, um, will call to each other in a very distinct kind of way. The, the male has a kind of a deeper Including sound, you'll hear the female calling back barred owls, which we have on up here too. Uh, and the same same thing. So you know, it's it's that territory marking, um, claiming, and and communication, uh, pretty much. They may have birds like American crows, for example, or common ravens, part of the corvid family, which are really really intelligent birds, also include. Um, blue jays and other kinds of jays, um, highly intelligent family. And crows, particularly American crows, are known, but I should have mentioned also warning signals is another reason that birds vocalize a lot to warn of, of danger. But crows kind of take that to the next level and they'll do fake warning calls where they'll be saying, there's a predator nearby, you know, Go and hide when there's no predator at all. They're just going, they want to get the food. And they will actually fool the other other birds uh, so that they can out-compete them uh, for the food. That's they're, they're really smart birds. And, and, and birds have such, this isn't really addressing that question, but I just just to think about it, that the, the memory that birds have is so incredible. One of the members of the Corbett family um, is called a Clark's Nutcracker, it's a Northwestern bird. But it can hide, and it does hide, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seeds in the fall, and can remember where virtually every one of them is located. You know, and so there are these memory things that certainly humans can begin to approach, unless we use AI, so that's what we do now. This whole program is on AI. No, but, um, yeah, so that memory thing is, is just, again, one, another one of the really, really remarkable skills uh, that, that birds have. And a lot of our typical songbirds here, too, chickadees and other birds have tremendous memories for located the food. I was amazed when I took a cruise down around uh, Cape May a few years ago. Yeah. And the guides had thought I was. All the offspring is 
a return of ospreys to that nest. Yeah. That they built before they left. <laughs> sure, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, faithfulness in birds returning to their, you know, their original nest, sometimes year after year, to the very same spot. Of course, again, these are birds flying from, in some cases, thousands of miles away, coming to this exact tree. Right. Based on these nests, you can see the different color patterns the birds put in the nests and say, oh. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. ospreys are, are, are famous for that. Um, yeah, they'll put up, uh, you know, Barbie dolls in there, uh, uh, fishing poles. Yeah, the same one, one time, the same one, you know, we bring something, you should look at it, <laughs> you can only put good junk in this nest. You may not put that bad junk, right? How long do birds live? Well, um, of course, it varies a lot, but when you talk about songbirds, not very long at all. I mean, typical for a small songbird is maybe three or four years. So, you know, some some will live a little longer than that. Every once in a while, you'll see, you know, this is chickadee that's 14 years old, but it's very, very, very unusual. They they have pretty, pretty short lifespans. So it's typically, you know, the smaller the bird, the shorter the, the lifespan is. Um, some of the larger birds live pretty, pretty long lives. Yes, So, do the birds adjust their migration? Um, how far they go and when they go based on the weather? I mean, well, or do they do it the same every year no matter what? You can make kind of a distinction between the, the neotropical migrants that are down in, in, the, in Panama, Central America, North and, Central, North and South America, and coming up here. So not really very weather related, because I mentioned before about they don't know what the weather is here when they're down there. That's why that triggering by light is the, is the good thing for them. But for birds that are shorter distance migrants, they can sort of get an idea of what the weather is here. And many birds move directly because of the, of the weather. Um, even robins that we see here um, are, are often migrant. So that, um, we see birds, there's kind of a shifting thing that goes on with robins where Sometimes in the spring, we'll see birds are from Canada that have moved down here. The birds here will have shifted further south. So they call them facultative migrants, and, and meaning essentially that they are going where the food is. And then you have in the wintertime here, we have all these many species of uh, boreal birds that nest way up in Canada and Alaska. And sometimes they stay up there but they will move south, not really because of the weather directly, but just because of the food supply. So there'll be a big explosion of spruce budworms, for example, in some of the trees, and they'll stay up there and feed on them. The next year, those there'll be a crash of those, and they'll come down here. So we'll see these enormous flights of pine systems, and cross bills, other, other finches coming down here. And owls too, great, uh, not great horned owls, but snowy owls. So a few years ago, we had a huge incursion uh, of snowy owls. And that is again a food dependency thing, basically having to do with the lending population, where they have an explosion of the population, and then a crash. And so the birds are coming down here looking for food. Well, typically younger birds, because the older birds you know, are more adept at finding prey, but the younger birds. We'll come down this way. Um, there's a fellow from um, Mass Audubon called Norman Smith, who uh, until recently ran the, uh, the Mass Audubon um, sanctuary over in Canton, the Blue Hills, Blue Hills Museum. And he became the guy who, in the wintertime, would go up to Logan Airport and track snowy owls because the snowy owls would recognize those air, that airport as native tundra or something like that, native tundra. And there's a lot of rodents there. That's why it's a the perfect place for them except for the airplanes, uh, so, which makes it not that perfect. 
So uh, Norman Smith would go up there and he, he would kind of invent this track and set it out there and put uh, part of a rabbit or something inside it. And snowy owls would go in there and they kept them. He would take them to either Plum Island or Duxbury Beach um, and release them there. Most of the time they would stay there until it was time to head, head back to North again. So it's a pretty effective uh, method. And I know that one year he trapped 150 snowy owls at Logan Airport. So that was one of those, that year it was just huge uh, incursion. Yes, ma'am. Uh, last summer, um, I had a hummingbird few, which you had for a few years, and the same ones come back every year. And I had about three who were visiting regularly, mm -hmm. and I started to notice uh, them vocalizing. Uh, it's kind of like a photo. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh. And, and then um, I noticed something had came like that. I, I looked at the speaker, it was empty. And they were like, hey, come on, can we see? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, hummingbirds in general are extremely aggressive. So the brr is really their wings. The sound of their wings, because they they're, they flap their wings, I forget what the number is, a thousand times a second or something, or something of the sort. They do vocalize also, um, but that brr thing is, is, is really okay. uh, the sound of the wings. The only bird that can fly backwards. They can fly backwards, upside down, sideways. They're also the only bird that can actually hover in the place. There are other birds that hover, like we may have seen uh, American kestrels that they used to call sparrow hawks. You see them hovering, but they're, they're flapping their wings and catching the wing. But a hummingbird can just hover. They can be in this room and just hover. Because they're in just incredibly complex way. I'm sorry? Like a drone. They were the original drone. Yeah. The original, the original drone. Yeah. I know this is a dumb question. So I have a dumb answer ready for it. Don't worry. It's always north south. Uh, but could it be east west for some reason? It, it is sometimes east west with some species. Yeah. And also, it can be up and down um, in terms of not north and south. I mean, um, altitude, I had it altitudinally. Uh, some birds will be up in the upper elevations and then come down into the lower elevations of the, uh, of the season. Yeah. There are even a few where there's a backwards migration where they'll go from the north to south. That's a kind of very uh, rare occurrence. But uh, there are a lot of variations uh, in that. But those are the Jim mentions uh, Jay also, uh, Jay's being a very intelligent uh, species. Yeah. And uh, I just uh, amusing story to me was a buddy and I were years ago were hiking from the top of Mount Washington uh, down to a two huts down the ridge, and a Canada Jay followed us the whole way, and he would just go from tree to tree as we went down the path, and it was like you know it was like a pet almost you know, and I said, oh what a friendly thing. Yeah. And he literally would can we turn around and he'd be right there and look at us the whole way down. I mean for a couple of hours. Yeah. Follow us from tree to tree. Yeah. Well that wasn't a question Yeah, I just saw it. <laughs> but maybe he's looking for food. Maybe he wants Oh yeah, well, you know the the Canada J has a has another has a nickname of Camp Robber. Because they're known as being so friendly. They'll come to your picnic table. They're kind of like gulls or seagulls. Yeah. Like, um, come and help themselves to whatever you have on your uh, table. So it wasn't affection. Was well, who knows? Maybe it was probably a little. In your case, it probably was affection. <laughs> so, but you didn't have any food display, right? No, it wasn't. Are we seeing more um, bluebirds up here now because of warming? Um, I haven't really seen. Statistics that say that. Um, I've never yeah. seen that before. Last year. Yeah, I, I think one thing is that bluebirds and other <coughs> rushes um, stay around here more in the, in the winter season. Don't go south as much as they used to because of the because of the warming temperatures, mm -hmm. um, which is that's sort of okay. But the problem with 
the, the migrating birds have traveled in long distances is the climate change is um, really affecting the timing of their migration so that when you have the insect bloom here in the spring, they get here too late and the, the insect bloom is over, has a big effect on their ability to be successful nesters. And that's one of the many things that climate change is, is, is doing. Yeah. Uh, what if hummingbirds um, migrate if they have such a high metabolic rate? Do they have any chance of being able to? Well, you know, it, it, the story used to be that when hummingbirds would come from Yucatan Peninsula, in Mexico, they had to go across. Sorry? Oh, oh sorry. Um, so they had to travel across the Gulf of Mexico, so they would kind of have your question how could they possibly do that? So the prevailing theory for a time was that they rode on the backs of geese. And that's how they got across um, <laughs> the Gulf of Mexico. But of course, how can they do it? Again, they, they store up that energy and they can fly, and they do fly, the ruby throated hummingbirds, particularly, uh, all the way across the Gulf of Mexico. And again, it has to be not a stop with light and no water or no resting or anything. So they uh, are do it. Yeah. Can they absorb a little rain if it's raining? If it's a yeah, they, they, yeah, they can. Well, they can, sure. But um, what they can absorb is when there's really violent storms. So sometimes they'll, they'll need a front. And it's great for bird watchers because there'll be this phenomenon called a fall. And you might get 200 warblers coming down in your yard. So, um, this is a spectacular sight for bird watchers, but not so good for the, uh, for the birds who are trying to get to, uh, get to their des destination. For the crackatorial birds, that, and if, if light is a trigger for migration, how, how does that work for birds here in the equator? How does it work for birds who even st <clears throat> stay there? Ooh, or, who happens to be near the equator where the light changes are so, are, 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 not, as, are not that great? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, but from what I understand, they, they can just, they can detect those very subtle changes not to make that happen because many of these birds are in the equator. So they, it's hard to imagine that they can do it, but it works for them. We'll probably, probably, yes, the question or are we open to them? One is, do you want to address the bigger bird, bigger birds eat a lot of smaller birds, or do you want to just eat like small animals? Like eagles or, you know, big predatory birds. Do they eat baby birds? Yes, well, you know, a lot of songbirds eat baby birds, too. Many birds that you wouldn't think of that. We're talking about red bellied woodpeckers and red headed woodpeckers. And, uh, many other birds, flickers, they'll eat other birds' eggs and little and chicks as well. So, so, so the babies from other types of birds, yeah, sure. Um, uh, generally not their own, no. Um, but in terms of birds preying on other birds, you know, you have uh, examples like Kufus hawks and um, shark shin hawks, which are. They call it excipitors, and they, they, their main prey is, is birds. So that's why you know people that have bird feeders know about this. Uh, it takes a, it's a, a bird feeder is like a little supermarket for Cooper's Hawk, Cooper's Hawks, and uh, Charge and Hawks. And our opponents will not be having their tickets being caught and scare off the child because they feed all the Yeah, yeah, bears are. An increasing problem, I mean, because you know, bears are getting, they're going to be in downtown Boston, I think, maybe next year. And so, yeah, there's so many places, you know, people, uh, I have friends further out in Western Mass who, you know, they have to take down their theaters until the birds go into hibernation. So, they're not delicate, generally, after the theaters. So, one last question there are certain birds that don't mind, like flamingo. 
I mean, yeah, there are lots of birds that don't, lots of birds that don't migrate. I mean, you can hear, you know, cardinals don't migrate, blue jays don't migrate, chickadees don't migrate. They're year, year round birds, tough to chip nice. So you see them all year, all year round. So they, they know, they don't. Yeah, so, so again, yeah, there's a lot of birds like that that are tropical birds that, that, that stay in the tropics all the time, don't, they don't migrate at all. Um, but again, it's a large percentage that they don't you know, do. Um, but as I say, there's, there's all kinds of different kinds of migration. Um, you know, the neotropical birds flying thousands of miles to, as I say, robins might come down from Canada to Vermont, you know, that kind of thing, depending on the food. Yes, sir. Can some birds at the margin uh, interbreed? Oh yes, for sure. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of hybridization that goes on among birds. Can, can we do we have to we, do we have to stop by the way? We don't have so much. It's okay. Oh, <laughs> 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 sorry. I shouldn't have asked that. Um, but, um, Let's see, what was the question again? Uh, do birds interbreed? Oh, interbreeding, yeah. So yeah, the answer is yes, you know, they, they, uh, I'm not a scientist to talk about, you know, how species work really, but, you know, generally the, the, the thought is that if birds can interbreed, that they're not separate species, but that's kind of been proven not, not to be the case, and there's more and more of that going on, sometimes to the detriment of one or the other species. Like black ducks, for example, which is similar to mallards, but they interbred a lot with mallards, and in the process, black ducks' populations have really been, been going down. Another bird that I'm thinking of is one of the, one of the warblers, the golden winged warbler, which hybridizes with the blue winged warbler. And then you get hybrids hybrids of those. And so there's like several, you've got the, you know, the rooster's warbler, and then there's another one, there's all these, you know, multiple cross breeds. And the effect of that has been to really uh, hurt the population of golden wing warblers and become very, very rare. So yeah, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of hybridization. But that's not going to be a similar size? I think generally that's, that's true, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, many birds are just separated by physical barriers and mountains and river systems and that sort of thing. And when they aren't, and that hybridization uh, takes place. But it's very, it's very, it's very common. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah.